Greetings to you from Garage Number 1. Stories about legends, it is series about most iconic cars in the world. Now it's time to talk about BMW M5 E39. The BMW M5 has long cemented itself in the automotive history as a perfect example of harmony between class, speed, and practicality. From the model's inception in 1984, the high-performance saloon has set the standard for the ultimate driving experience with four doors. The third generation, dubbed as the E39, shocked the automotive world upon its release in 1999. The car boasted BMW M Division's first street-going V8 mated to a six-speed transmission, yes, three pedals were the only option if you wanted an M5. At first glance, the car appeared to be an unassuming executive sedan. Only enthusiasts knew to look for the special wheels, bumpers, and small embadging if they wanted to confirm the witnessing of a beast. Rated at 400 horsepower, the E39 M5 could hit 100 km per hour in 4.8 seconds with an unrestricted top speed of 299 km per hour. The car was a major success with over 20,000 units leaving Munich from the year 2000 to 2003. Fast forward almost two decades later, many car lovers still consider the E39 M5 to be among one of best sports cars ever produced. It's the M5 that might just be the most perfect archetype of the M genus. The raw ingredients are bewitching in their simplicity, a 4.9-liter normally aspirated V8 engine, a six-speed manual gearbox and rear-wheel drive. There are many reasons why this could be seen as the zenith of BMW's M car development, but it's the combination of conceptual purity and execution that distinguishes it. Consider what came next. The E60 M5 was, by comparison, a bit of a tangle. We can argue back and forth on Chris Bangle's styling for that car, and the same goes for the V10 power plant, but the M division lost its nerve when it came to the fundamental way the M5 went down the road. The E39 offered an artfully polished chassis setup from the factory. Good drivers instinctively knew how to get the best from it. The E60 M5 swamped the customer in choices because this was a vehicle with almost 600 permutations of gearshift method, power settings, shift speeds, suspension adjustments and traction control thresholds. The E39 M5 had a sport button and the ability to disengage the dynamic stability control DSC. That's it. And few bother pressing sport because it oversharpens the throttle and adds unnecessary heft to the steering. The throttle and steering are artfully honed as they are. Equally straightforward was the M5's mission. It had to wrest back superiority from Mercedes-Benz and AMG. BMW knew that a falterback was forging a technical lead in powerful V8 models, following the large capacity units seen in the W124 sedans and coupes. Its successor, the W210, was introduced in 1996, and E50 and E55 AMG models soon followed. BMW had stretched the S38 B38 straight six to capacity in the E34 M5 with the final cars making 250 kilowatts, but Munich knew it needed a power plant that represented a step change in philosophy and capability. The 4.9 liter S62 V8 in the M5 was the first eight cylinder engine fitted to an M car, and some diehards were at first affronted by this heavily reworked version of the 4.4 liter lump from the 540i claiming that it fundamentally changed the character of the M5. It needed to. As Alexander Hildebrandt, the E39 M5 project leader, said, I well remember the discussions about the BMW M5, and how, in the eyes of some M fans, it still had a flaw, namely that V8 engine. The alternative was a heavily boosted 6 which, with the benefit of hindsight, would have rapidly been outgunned as AMG turned to forced induction for its V8s. The E39 M5 was also a landmark car insofar as it was not built at the BMW Motorsport facility at Garching, instead running down the regular 5 Series line at Dingolfing, near Munich. Any suspicion that it might have been M-Lite or dumbed down in any way were scotched when it became clear how extensive its upgrades were. The engine was bored and stroked to 4,941 cubic centimeters and fitted with individual electronically controlled throttle bodies hollow camshafts, 
a duplex chain drive for the intake cams and a trick lubrication system with G-Force sensitive scavenge pumps. The suspension retained the basic 5 Series configuration of struts up front and a multi-link rear, but all the details were changed. The steering links were strengthened, the bushings beefed up, unique front wheel bearings were engineered, heftier lower rear control arms from the E39 Touring were introduced, while the rear integral link came from the V12 750IL. Polyurethane auxiliary springs sharpened body control, as did junking the rubber rear suspension bushings for steel ball joints. The spring height was cut and spring rates increased, shock valving was modified and thicker anti-roll bars were fitted front and rear. At the end of this exercise there was very little commonality between the suspension of the M5 and that of the 540i. The M division then sharpened the ratio of the recirculating ball steering, fitted bigger brakes, 18-inch alloy wheels, ESC stability control that talked to the Siemens MSS52 Motronic digital engine control system, and a beautiful exhaust that finished in quad tips. A subtle but purposeful body kit, clear turn signals and a broader kidney grille gave the E39 M5 the requisite look of restrained menace. Wheels somewhat missed the boat on the E39 M5. The first comparison test we put it into was in April 2003, by which time it had been on sale in most markets for four years. In those intervening years, Mercedes had retired the W210 E55 AMG and its successor, the W211 generation model, had acquired a 350kW and 700Nm supercharged V8. Against that sort of muscle, the 294kW and 500Nm BMW looked a little gun-shy. Nevertheless, wheel scribe Graham Smith realized that while a new front had opened in the power wars, the M5 was still the sharper tool, noting the BMW's chassis is a driver's delight compared to the Benz's which, while being awesomely competent, lacks for those last few degrees of engagement. It's those final degrees that differentiate a good sports sedan from a great one. And, make no mistake, the E39 M5 deserves its place at the very top table. Take its size. Its road footprint is significantly smaller than a modern M3 so it never feels unwieldy to thread along a twisty road. It is heavy, though, and the suspension tune, while more focused than its 5 Series brethren feels, by today's standards, relaxed. The interior stands up beautifully from an ergonomic perspective, the dial pack hailing from an age when BMW put a premium on readability. There's an inherent rightness about a 6-speed manual, hydraulically assisted steering and a good old-fashioned handbrake. For many, the E39 M5 marked a sweet spot, a blink and you'll miss it handover from the analog to the digital. So you have a central screen with SAT and AV, a drive-by-wire throttle and the safety net of a rudimentary ESC system should you want it, but almost everything else is old school. The E39 M5 didn't change a great deal throughout its lifetime. Some additional paint finishes were phased in, and the car received a facelift in 2001. That introduced the Angel Eye headlights, revised LED taillights, front parking sensors, a chubbier E46 M3 style steering wheel, an upgraded SAT and AV screen, rear head airbags, gray dials, an upgrade to the aircon and the option of a punchier M audio system. For such a specialist model, the M5 is far from temperamental, but when inspecting one it pays to understand which parts are M5 specific, and therefore expensive. BMW ironed out a lot of snagging points with the 2001 facelift, so many of the irritating minor quality issues that afflicted early cars were fixed. In other words, buy on condition, but if you're down to a decision, buy as late an E39 M5 as you can get. There are three key mechanical issues with the E39 that you need to keep tabs on. The S62 lump featured a secondary air injection system to reduce cold start emissions. Over time, burnt engine oil vapors are ingested via the intake manifold and create a solid buildup in the cylinder head that requires an expensive fix. Look for the SES light illuminated in the dash and a secondary air pump low flow fault code. The Vano's variable valve timing system also can be susceptible to a diesel-like rattling. Some owners cure this by introducing heavier oil. Don't do this. 
BMW initially recommended 10W60 but in March 2000 changed that to a 5W30 Castrol TWS, edge these days. Due to a minor change to the piston rings the rattle is fairly normal at startup as the oil makes its way to the top of the engine. Post-March 2000 cars received an oil accumulator to try to alleviate this issue. The third item to look out for is a worn timing chain tensioner, an issue often exacerbated by incorrect oil usage. It can seize, which wears the chain and its guides. It's not a big job but ask the previous owner when it was last performed. It's a relatively inexpensive part and changing it every 40,000 kilometers seems wise. Make the effort to track down a good BMW E39 M5 and it still has the ability to make many modern super sedans seem long on window dressing and short on nuanced chassis engineering. The M5 was a case study in how to transition a hand-built sensibility onto a line-built car. It was purposeful, athletic, and charismatic, and now, as we crave feedback, delicacy, and authenticity more than ever, its light only burns brighter. Thank you for attention. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and Facebook page and stay tuned for the next story from Garage Number 1.